The following is a talk by Leon Hirsch, H-I-R-S-H, before the Eastern Oklahoma Westerners Organization, dealing with the rise and fall of Jack Walton. Developing the best. 
and to your own ability to predict the probable reactions of human nature to the current situation in the fabric of history. Back in the year 1919, there began to emerge a marked reaction from the artificially stimulated national economy that resulted from the First World War, which had ended with the armistice in November of 1918. During the years 1920-21, not only Oklahoma, but the entire nation was in the grip of a severe economic depression. Bank failures were occurring throughout the land, reaching such a peak in Oklahoma that the state bank guarantee fund, Oklahoma's proud progenitor of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, was hopelessly bankrupted. The banks and the guarantee fund had not failed from a lack of assets, an ill-planned contraction of the federal currency had made their notes uncollectible, as again occurred in the Great Depression of the early 30s. The closing of the banks resulted in the loss of individual savings, an epidemic of mortgage foreclosures, the wiping out of business capital, and widespread business failure. Unrest had mounted throughout the country. The coal miners went out on a protracted strike, paralyzing the great industries of the nation. The railroads also were struck, resulting in an effort to move even the mail by use of the war-developed air force, with disastrous results in plane crashes amounting to a national scandal over the uh, unpreparedness of military pilots to operate equipment that was unsuitable for such purposes. Moreover, a wave of lawlessness and violence mounted over the nation, necessitating martial law in several states. In this atmosphere, across the Middle West, a socialistic-oriented movement, which had its birth in Minnesota and the Dakotas, spread as a panacea particularly accepted by workers and farmers, an unbelievably incompatible coalition that had not even been envisioned by Marx and Lenin. In the states of its origin, it was called the Nonpartisan League, and it had attracted to those states, among compatriots from other states, most of the leaders of the then defunct Socialist Party in Oklahoma. By February 1922, most of these Oklahomans had returned, along with other emigres from the Northwest, and they had announced the formation of an organization which they called the Farmer Labor Reconstruction League. This organization was supposedly a nonpartisan economic association calculated to exert political pressure through block solidarity in controlling the dominant Democratic Party of the state to compel the adoption of its then radical economic progressive measures. Founded upon socialistic governmental paternalism, a program that could be characterized as virtually reactionary today. Paralleling that movement, and one of the predominant manifestations of lawlessness gripping the country, was the mushroom growth of a secret society called the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, an organization predicated upon white Protestant bigotry and avowedly to enforce by strong-arm mob tactics, the correction of the morals of all Negroes, Catholics, Jews, and all other non clansmen This society was being promoted with singular success by money-hungry and power-hungry organizers in virtually all sections of the nation, with concentrated emphasis on those in political office. The members at Klan meetings and in frequent parades wore sheet-like robes and hoods, which completely disguised the wearers, modeled on the costumes of a post-Civil War counterpart of the organization, long since discredited and disbanded. Membership was supposed to be a secret, and by some, some inexplicable sophistry, the fact of membership became automatically expunged in any event of inquiry, thereby affording one a 
supposedly truthful denial of membership, past and present. Notwithstanding frequent lynch-like activities, such as unmerciful lashings, tar and feathers, and even physical mutilations of victims who might incur the hatred of its members or local leaders, the organization was able to recruit for membership many respected citizens of the communities wherein it had local branches. In fact, its membership was so large in many sections of the country, including Oklahoma, that most elected officials were members providing virtual immunity to those indulging in mob lawlessness under cover of their clan rules. During this period of deep unrest, there was appearing on the Oklahoma horizon, as in such periods there always had and probably always will appear, the star of a man of personal magnetism, unscrupulous ambition, and opportunistic genius, all in sufficient quantities to capitalize on the ever-present public hope for a messiah to alleviate such conditions of turmoil. Such men invariably seek to acquire, as a base for their popular, popular, popular following, some currently large activist group to use for their own pur purposes, as long as expedience indicates, when expanded to a dominant following, that they can be so used. And such men frequently succeed for a time in attaining their ambition, but invariably fail for lack of one or another of the personal qualities necessary to more classic fulfillment of their objectives. The star rising in the Oklahoma, on the Oklahoma horizon at that time was not one of long endurance. It was more of the nature of the meteor, which arose, flared in brilliance for less than two years, and burned itself out in the heat of its own ill-calculated excesses. That meteor was John Calloway Walton, self-styled and commonly known as Jack Walton. For a brief biological, a biographical sketch, he was a native of Indiana, and during his childhood, a resident of Nebraska and Arkansas. During his early manhood, prior to Oklahoma statehood, he had served as a timekeeper for a railroad construction contractor that was building a railroad later completed through Tahlequah, connecting Fayetteville, Arkansas to Oklahoma, Tulsa, and Oklahoma City. Learning the trade of a tradesman, he became a locomotive engineer for the Mexican National Railroad, and there acquired, in some undocumented manner, the fundamentals of civil engineering. Thereafter, this was evidenced mostly by self salesmanship In the late 20s, he became the senior partner in an engineering firm known as Walton & Kessler of Kansas City, a firm that was eminently successful in municipal planning and in engineering municipal water and sewage plants, largely through the superior talents of the junior partner, exploited by the magnetic salesmanship of Walton. That firm having dissolved as a natural consequence of the national growing, uh, the growing national fame of Mr. Kessler, Walton moved to Oklahoma City during the early days of World War I, formed another engineering partnership there, and was bitten by the political bug. In 1917, he sought the Democratic nomination for Commissioner of Public Works in Oklahoma City, and over the bitter opposition of the newspapers and entrenched commercial interests, he was nominated and elected for a four-year term. Two years later, in 1919, he successfully ran for mayor of Oklahoma City without resigning his commission post and was thereby enabled to appoint his successor to the latter and to increase his power in the city's governing board. For the next four years, Oklahoma City experienced continual political bitterness between Walton and his political opposition, a bitterness kept at a high temperature by the Metropolitan Press engendered by the personal enmity of the publisher, D.K. Gaylord, toward all who would not acknowledge his dictatorial dominance. Controlling the majority of the city commission, Walton succeeded in transferring the control of the police department to his control and was upheld by the courts in so doing. He flooded the city 
with police per courtesy cards, which furnished the bearers with immunity from arrest. And with the typical demagogic flair for pageantry, he, he established a mounted police corps a pic in picturesque uniforms on beautiful horses to patrol the downtown traffic, although it already was becoming largely motorized. In the winter of 1921, <coughs> there occurred a strike for the packing house workers, resulting in violence between the strikers and strike breakers brought in by the packers. And Walton exhibited marked sympathy for the strikers for reasons which were made obvious a few months later, refusing all police protection to the packing plants for the announced reason that the packing plants were located outside the city limits. The violence flared to the extreme of a strike breaker being hanged in the Capitol Hill area, inducing the Chamber of Commerce to appeal to then Governor Roberts to declare martial law to preserve the peace. Parenthetically and contemporaneously, a bloody and fiery race riot had occurred in Tulsa, which is another story quite recently prior to that time. And it had taken virtually the full strength of the National Guard to suppress that race riot. To counter the appeal of the Chamber of Commerce for troops, Walton requested permission of that civic group to address them, which it, long his political enemy, abruptly refused. Thereupon, Walton issued a call for a citizens' mass meeting to show the populace the popular support of the citizens for the mayor. Literally thousands attended this mass meeting, held on a bitterly cold January night, at which the request for martial law was loudly protested. And this protest was heeded by Governor Roberts with understandable political scarcity. This meeting was all that Walton needed to prove his personal political appeal, an appeal that he nurtured by establishing that same month, a municipal soup line for the unemployed and destitute, of which there were many, both in the city and throughout the state, as a result of the deplorable economic conditions already mentioned. Closely following the mass meeting, in February 1922, the newly organized Farmer Labor Reconstruction League held a convention in Shawnee to perfect its machinery to capture the control of the Democratic Party in the state. The culmination of that meeting was a speech by Walter and a well-staged Brian-like stampede nominating him as the lead candidate for governor on the Democratic ticket in the scheduled summer primary election. Naturally, the platform adopted at the convention was a virtual repetition of the Dakota Nonpartisan League program. And Walter, clearly having been furnished with a copy before the convention, had endorsed every paragraph of it in his speech. The leaders immediately thereafter commenced a campaign to ensure registration of every member and sympathizer as a Democrat, singularly uh, akin to the tactics adopted by the McGovern faction prior to the Miami Democratic Convention in 1972. And Walton, demonstrating the ever-present talent of his prototype for equivocation, grew in public stature as the friend of the farmer, the laborer, and the downtrodden, and even of the small businessman, entirely oblivious of the obvious conflict of the divergent interests of those groups. It was literally a case of politics making strange bets out. On August 1st, Walton received the Democratic nomination by a large plurality. There was no runoff in those days. And the Daily Oklahoma, in a front page editorial termed the result a victory of the Catholics and labor over the Klan in an obvious effort on their part to consolidate Protestant, Klan, and conservative opposition to Walton. In the November general election, Walton was, uh, was, uh, let's see, no, that's not that The result, however, was instead a personal victory for Walton, certainly not of the Farmer Labor League in the November election. State Senator W.M. Darnell, an acknowledged farm leader and the lead candidate for Lieutenant Governor, received only 45,000 votes in his unsuccessful attempt to supplant M.E. Trapp, a wealthy municipal bond dealer, and by no means for 
progressively oriented. When the state democratic convention met in mid-August, its adopted platform dropped most of the league's programs from the democratic platform. But Walton publicly rejected that platform and reaffirmed his allegiance to the Shawnee program, thereby choosing to assert his carefully established personal image in preference to a role as a regular Democrat. In his ensuing campaign, he pursued the course of a typical demagogue, among other things using such irrelevant gimmicks as had proven effective for a demagogic Chicago mayor by terming the Republican nominee, farm labor publisher John Field, a pro-British jackass. And riding the crest of his popularity with the divergent factions that only his personal magnetism held together, yet sowing the seeds of future bitter, bitter opposition in other, in other quarters, he was elected governor by the largest plurality ever yet recorded in a state gubernatorial election. However, M.E. Trapp, also an outspoken Klansman, anti Klansman, with a Catholic wife, and overtly disclaiming agreement with Walton about policy, received a plurality of more than double the Walton margin of victory. In January 1923, Walton was inaugurated before a huge crowd that filled the then unlandscaped fields in front of the state capitol. And the next day, he hosted more than 75,000 people at a barbecue at the Oklahoma City Fairgrounds. This was truly a Lucullus feast, where all comers were served beef, pork, bear meat, venison, antelope, chicken, rabbit, oxen, and or squirrel that had been donated and prepared over ember filled and wire-covered trenches occupying several acres of ground. Coffee was dispensed in tin cups that were furnished from huge wooden bats, each having a capacity of 8,800 gallons and 36 spigots. As a personal note, at this point, I became an assistant attorney general under General George Short, a former Northeastern College faculty member, on Inauguration Day. And that served to give me this front row eyewitness seat at the tragic comedy that ensued. Notwithstanding the very real political entrenchment of the Klan, whose enmity Walton had already invited, and his snub of the Democratic Party, in only less than a month prior to his inauguration, he had been able to gain control of the organization of the legislature and to induce it to enact many of the proposals of the Shawnee program. But his major success was personal in securing an unprecedented multiplication of state jobs for his personal pattern, positions which he immediately filled with his supporters, a large portion of whom were league radicals and overt socialists. Then, beginning in February 1923, the already intolerable tempo of whippings and other mob manifestations by Klan began to arise to alarming proportions throughout the state. Although receiving minimal mention from the metropolitan press, by June, most of the state was being victimized by Klan terrorism. Such mob violence was almost a nightly affair in Tulsa, Okmulgee, Anadarko, and other vicinities. Oklahoma County, too, was far from immune. And by the time of adjournment of the legislature in early June, Walton Hike and Anna Walton political lines had begun to be drawn on the grounds of the Klan and of Walton's executive excesses in his office. Riding the crest of his personal popularity in some quarters, he sought to enha enhance it in others, seeking to capitalize on general public revulsion towards Klan mob, mob violence. He loudly declared all-out war on the Klan as his principal objective, and at the same time sought to attract a conservative-oriented citizenry by taking over the Farmer Labor League and kicking out its radical organizers. And many radicals that he had placed in high state office. Perhaps inducing the latter action was the situation that he had run out of jobs to award to others. But even the vacancies created were not enough to supply the patronage demand made on them. About that time, he discovered that clemency to convicts could be used as a patronage tool also. He began to issue pardons and paroles in mounting volumes. Any self-styled faithful adherence with a tale of financial distress, importuning him 
for a job would be given and executed by pardon or parole, and would be told that surely some convict or his family would remedy, remedy the financial deficiency if the blank were filled in with the proper name. Until the Attorney General's office established the illegality of such an omission, even the seal of the Secretary of State was dispensed with. However, in all fairness to the man, at the later impeachment trial, we were wholly unable to establish, and I truly do not believe, that Walton himself ever profited a dime from this wholesale abuse of his power to plant. Late in June, in pursuing his war on the Klan, Walton declared law in Oklahoma to stop mob violence. And a week later, he forced the calling of a grand jury at Anadarko to probe the lashings reported from that area. At this escalation of hostilities, the Klan faction in the legislature, unquestionably large in numbers, reinforced by those appalled at Walton's flagrant perversion and abuse of his, exec of his executive power, induced 21 state senators to join in the demand that he call a special session of the legislature for the purpose of investigating his abuse of his official powers, a demand that he summarily rejected. At this, Camel Russell, a former Muscogean, who had been a political gadfly at his statehood and was defeated as a candidate for corporation commission at the preceding election, began the circulation of an initiative petition to authorize the legislature to convene itself for impeachment purposes. In July, for some unexplained reason, but possibly to hamper the obtaining of signatures to the Russell petition, if possible, Walton abruptly terminated martial law in Oak but threatened it in Tulsa and Kingfisher to stop the rash of clan rations, slashing, and tar and feathering in those localities. And in mid-August, he directed the institution of the Military Court of Inquiry in Tulsa, under Adjutant General Baird Markham, assisted by the Attorney General's office, an appointment that was given to me by General Short, to root out the Klan in Tulsa County. We set up headquarters in the Hotel Tulsa. A military curfew was imposed throughout the city, and media evidence began to develop. We saw Klan victims horribly mutilated from a lash consisting of a strap of shoe sole leather affixed to a baseball bat handle and rendered into a vicious weapon by attaching to the end of the strap a short length of steel wire. Some of those weapons were seized by the military and brought into the court of inquiry. Moreover, it was a frequent occurrence for nude, tar and feather victims to be ejected from cars in midday at a prominent corner in downtown Tulsa. As evidence began, began to mount on prominent Tulsa and their jailing by the military, followed by the indiscriminate issuance of writs of habeas corpus by Tulsa-based courts, General Markham ordered the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus there. This latter created a news media engendered furor, but it did produce a public offer from the Tulsa Klan to disband in exchange for the lifting of martial law, and mind you, and the guarantee of immunity to public officer Klan, conditions which the governor summarily rejected. In August, apparently to divert attention from the growing political pressures upon him, Walton called a statewide election to be held on October 2nd for submission of certain measures which had been referred by the regular session of the legislature, among which were extending to women eligibility to elective and appointed state office, which it did not previously provide, providing for a soldier's bonus, for a special state levy for public schools, and for reimbursement by the state to depositors in failed state banks, all of which were obviously politically oriented. But the month of September saw affairs a fever heat. A grand jury was called in Oklahoma City to investigate the governor, which was prevented from meeting by a National Guardsmen, accompanied by the mounting of machine guns on the county jail across an alley from the courthouse. The governor vowed to break the Klan at any cost, asserting that he would pardon anyone who shot a Klan. The head of the state Klan, later arrested for participation in the whipping and released by a justice of peace, ordered the Klan to mobilize to fight the governor. The governor demanded the resignation of the head of the Muscogee Klan, threatened and threatened censorship of the Tulsa Tribune for inciting riots. Martial law was extended to the entire state after the Muscogee Klan issued a public defiance to the governor and held a mass demonstration in downtown Muscogee. And a state 
speculators of the Russia Russell petition had claimed sufficient signatures for calling an election and had prevailed on Se Secretary of State General R.A. Sneed to issue a proclamation for the election on October 2nd, the date set for the election for the initiative measures by the government. On that date, that is the date uh, that uh, they announced this, the governor procured a temporary injunction from a district judge who had been appointed by him in Oklahoma County in joining the holding of the October 2nd election. But that ruling was appealed to the Supreme Court. On September 20th, Speaker of the House, W.D. McBee, issued a call signed by 59 House members awaiting the outcome of the October election. On the day preceding, that is the 25th, the National Guard was ordered to prevent the meeting and ordered to shoot to kill if necessary to prevent this meeting of the revolutionaries. And at the same time, laws had called on all male citizens of the state between the ages of 21 and 45 to arm themselves and come to the assistance of the state against the Klan revolutionaries. On se September 26 will be a date that I will remember to my dying day. When I went to the Capitol that morning, it was surrounded by armed militiamen, and I was required to furnish identification before I could go to my office. The atmosphere of the Capitol itself seemed to be electrically charged. Feelings in Oklahoma City had been further inflamed by a front page editorial in the Oklahoma that morning, rhetorically asking if all Klansmen were outlaws. Notwithstanding the governor's orders banning the proposed meeting of the legislature that day, no legislator was denied admittance to the Capitol. But armed guardsmen with bayonets affixed to their rifles stood at all entrances to the legislative chambers on the fourth floor. Shortly before noon, I went to the fourth floor rotunda where legislators and state house employees were milling about. The, the atmosphere was so intense that it could literally be felt. At the stroke of noon, the clerk of the house mounted the marble railing encircling the fourth floor rotunda, preparing to call the roll of the house. Immediately, Colonel W.S. Key of Wewoka, the designated military commander of Oklahoma City, stopped him and loudly directed everyone on the floor to remain motionless. At this queue, armed guardsmen, wearing sidearms with holster flaps unsnapped, emerged from all the offices opening on the fourth floor corridors and mixed with the crowd, while Colonel Key read an order directing the immediate dispersal and the evacuation of the floor, an order which the guardsmen firmly and quietly enforced. The legislators then repaired to the Huckins Hotel, where they decided to await the outcome of the election on the Russell Initiative petition. Thereafter, everything that happened was a sort of a, a heavy climax to that emotion front morning. The initiative measure passed in every county in the state on October 2nd. The Supreme Court, having dissolved the injunction to block the end of that election on the day of the dispersal of the Rump session, it was learned the next day that this action had taken place. By election day, however, Walton sword rattler had alienated even most citizens who sympathized with his war on the Klan. Besides, the fight was being assumed largely by anti-Klan, which were organizing all over the state for that purpose, potentially threatening a virtual civil war, which fortunately did not materialize, partly due to the cowardice of the sheeted monsters and partly because the clans were losing members by the score, the saner members being thoroughly disenchanted with the activities of the Russell elements. On October 5th, a call was issued under the Russell measure for a special session to convene on the 17th of September. And the day after, the 6th, Walton himself called a special session to convene on October 11th, a week prior to the legislative call, to investigate the clans and to pass Anabaskan legislation. At the same time, to help his image with others in the state, he lived at the statewide martial law. Although the special call, session call was never explained, it was believed that he thought that his call for the special session to begin on the 8th, uh, no, on the 11th, uh, would serve to nullify the, the self-call by the legislature and further would limit action at the forthcoming session to the matter that was specified in his call as is provided in the Constitution. Also, three days later, he offered to resign if the anti-masking law would be passed 
and the legislature would adjourn without accepting any impeachment action. But the legislators, buoyed by the overwhelming passage of the Russell measure, while all others, all other measures submitted at the election had gone down in defeat, convened on the 11th and marked time until the 17th, except for my assignment by General Short at the request of Speaker McGee to McBee to research the legal aspects of impeachment and advise the House on drafting of the Articles of Impeachment. Based on the study of the Federalist Papers, which dealt with the constitutional features, and upon a study of the record of the Andrew Johnson administration impeachment, and also of a relatively recent impeachment in New York of its governor, two Articles of Impeachment were prepared and adopted on October 23rd and were transmitted to the Senate, which accepted them and set the date for the trial for November 1st. And Walton, and it further ordered that Walton should be suspended from office pending the outcome of the trial in accordance with the constitutional provision for that action in such cases. That provision differs from the federal constitution in, a, in one regard. Since our constitutional convention, profiting from the experience gained in the Andrew Johnson impeachment, deemed it advisable to provide for the suspension to minimize the danger of corruption of senators by offers of executive political patronage during the trial. The Johnson conviction having failed by only one vote in the Congress. Walton's suspension, however, was not uncontested. He immediately obtained district court injunction against the Lieutenant Governor Trapp from taking over the governor's office on the ground that the impeachment was a Klan conspiracy, at least inferentially and ridiculously, it's including me uh, in, the, uh, in the insinuation as an accomplice to the conspiracy for my activity in drafting the Articles of Impeachment and in assisting in the trial before the Senate, while ignoring my participation in the routing of the Klan in Tulsa, and in my total incompatibility with the Klan being a prime object of the bigotry uh, which that organization bore to all those of my religious persuasion. As the matter has, as the matter has arisen in Washington, to what would as to what would constitute a tenable, impeachable offense. That question had arisen naturally in the drafting of the Articles of Impeachment against Walton, and consideration was fully given to it. That question, however, was easily resolved by us by resort to an elementary legal axiom that the law is whatever it is declared to be by the highest court from which there is no appeal, namely, the Senate sitting is a court of impeachment, the only court with the power to decide whether an accusation and the proof of it established an impeachable offense, either by accepting or rejecting the accusation, or by convicting or acquitting the accused. This was explained in the Federalist Papers, and the entire proceeding, that the entire proceeding is one of a political nature and is not governed by ordinary rules of criminal jurisprudence. The day following the granting of the injunction by the district court, General Short and I persuaded the Supreme Court to vacate that injunction and instead to enjoin Walton himself from interference with Trapp, with, with Trapp as acting as governor. And the following day, we prevailed upon the federal court, sitting in Lawton, to refuse an injunction to Walton in an action against the legislature filed there, in which he advanced his familiar claim of Klan conspiracy. This latter ruling was appealed to the United States Supreme Court and there affirmed. Following my own appearance as co-counsel with General Short, by reason of special permission from the Supreme Court, I being ineligible for regular admission due to the lack of three years of practice as a lawyer, having been admitted to the bar to enable my appointment as Assistant Attorney General only on January 5th of that year. Following Walton's suspension, the House adopted 20 additional articles of impeachment, supplementing the first two which were transmitted to the Senate prior to the commencement of the trial on November 1st. And during the course of the trial, Walton dramatically arose and walked out of the Senate chamber. At the conclusion of the trial, of the 22 counts, Walton was convicted of 11 counts and acquitted on five, the remainder being dismissed during the course of the trial by the House Board of Managers conducting the prosecution. In fairness to Walton, it must be reported that none of the charges on which he was convicted convicted, involved any personal corruption on his part, but were based upon his abuse of executive power, summed up in the final count on which he was convicted of general incompetence. And finally, 
approach, however, one incongruous note must be mentioned. That is, that four years after the impeachment trial, our Supreme Court held that the arrest, that the election calling, or that was called for the uh, Russell Initiative measure, had been illegally submitted, and that the measure therefore was void. <coughs> so Walton himself had called special session that impeached him, and he needn't have called. 